Uh, we, we are going to give this away at the end, so pay attention. Um, my book also will be coming out uh, in print. It's written with Ashlock. And um, the neat thing about this, if I can do this right, um, is that we wrote it in open source. Uh, and it's written in ASCII doc, and here are a bunch of changes from our production people, and you can actually see all the commits and go ahead and fork this whole thing, um, and you can either you know, read it right here because there's an ASCII doc editor in GitHub, um, or not, or go buy it, and then you'll get the whole the versions and the whatever. Today we're going to walk through a couple of the chapters um, that this book is covering. So um, the URL for this is continuousdev.org. Uh, if nothing else, I would just urge you to remember that and remember that only. And then maybe remember some of the things that we're going to walk through um, that I'll show you in code. And this is going to be um, an interesting type of a presentation because instead of the IDE, we're going to go straight from the repo. Um, and that'll be fine. Um, there are a couple things um, that I should probably illustrate first. Um, one is this notion of working with Java persistence and relational data. This is a topic that we talk a lot about. Um, when we talk about testing, it's Testing any type of a thing is really easy until you get to a real world situation where you've got to actually do something like work with transactions or work with data stores. Um, and what we do in this book is every chapter takes kind of one use case and then we'll kind of show you how we work through for our example application for the use case. And the entire book um, is building, working towards building one application called GeekSeek. All right. And this GeekSeq uh, is kind of outlined in chapter four here, where we talk about requirements in the example application. Has anyone used the application Lanyard? It's a web app. It's a, it's a conference tracker. It's a way of saying that, hey, I'm going to talk at this thing, and I'm going to go to this conference, and it'll give you like a calendar, and it'll show you who's going to be there, and it kind of helps you to like organize your schedules for a conference all in one place, much like maybe TripIt does for travel. Um, so we kind of copied that idea and figured we would make this application called GeekSeek. Um, and you know, for the book, we'd post it online, and that thing ends up living right here. Um, oh, that was the wrong button. <coughs> is it control click? How does this thing work? Command click? I just want to open the window. Just for, it's fine, it's fine. I've used computers before, I swear. <laughs> no. It's like the worst dream I've ever had. Um, so let's start off you know, working with persistence and relational data. Um, I could talk to you a bit about, we're all familiar with the relational data model, right? Object relational mapping, JPA. You're just raising your hands because you know Emmanuel's sitting right there and like wrote all of that, basically. <laughs> um, so when we talk about the relational data model, we, we, we find that it's actually kind of difficult to test. We have use cases where we want to say like, all right, as a user, um, as a user of this example application, we want to be able to create sessions, we want to be able to log in, we want to be able to register to associate ourselves with the venue and then draw some of the relationships. In other words, we basically want to test the CRUD operations of this are working correctly, and in addition to that, um, that our transactional semantics are such that when we want to do a compound operation like create a conference that has a bunch of sessions in it, they all kind of like go in at once. Um, and we have a bunch of technical concerns as well in terms of concurrent access, multi-user access, fault tolerance, uh, these types of things. Um, we're all familiar with entity objects. I'm not going to go over that. What I am going to do is I'm going to start to take a look um, at our requirement testing scenarios. Okay? And in order to test the data, what we really want to do, uh, as I say, is perform the CRUD operations on these entities. We want to execute operations on known data sets, right? Because 
we're not starting, an application doesn't start with like an empty thing and then I add myself to it and then see that I'm there. That's not how things work in the real world. It'd actually be much more useful for us to populate this database with a whole bunch of dummy data and then do some business operations and then validate that the data that's in the store is in some expected form, right? And that may take a lot. So then the natural question for us becomes, all right, what's the best way for us to populate it with all this dummy data? And then on top of that, what's the best way for us to validate the data store is in the proper state when we're done with the operation? So we've got this Archelian persistence extension. Archelian is an extendable platform, uh, and the persistence extension adds a whole bunch of JPA-centric um, actions to, to our Archelian tests. So we'll be able to do things on a per-test basis, like we can commit each test when we're done. We can roll back uh, the transaction at the end of each test when it's done. Um, or we can disable transactions entirely. Um, we talk a little bit about how to configure this. Um, and then we get into how we write out the test itself. This is something that I want to really show. How do I make this control and then scroll or just bigger? Uh, zooming? Uh, yeah, can we, can we read this better? Well, <laughs> it's a verbose language, but it does get the job done. Like French with your script keys, French. Um, we have a very simple class definition. It has the run with annotation. This is a JUnit annotation that allows us to forward control over to Archelian. It basically denotes that this is going to be an Archelian test and we'll be depending upon our Killian to start up the container and deploy into it. We also have the transactional annotation at the class level, which, much like it is in EJB, is going to say, hey, uh, for all of the methods that are in here, all the test methods, we're going to commit them at the end of this, right? We define our deployment. This deployment annotation and this method here, this is shrink wrap like we talked a little bit about before, where we actually assemble what we're going to deploy into the test. Um, and that's what Archelium will know to deploy. It will create a war that looks kind of like this guy here. Um, and then we've got um, this injection point right here. We're going to inject this right into the test. This repository is an object that we've created. It's an abstraction for interacting with data. So we have many different types of repositories. This one is going to be a repository that works with um, JPA-based data, and it will be working uh, specifically with the conference object. So this is how we're going to interact with JPA. This is basically our abstraction above the entity manager. Okay. We can do all sorts. Of, we can add um, some Boolean statics to the class to show that, like, we've got our, our created and removed events fired, and we can even add in CDI annotations to make sure that the test receives these events um, and can validate upon them when they're done. Um, now for the tests. By the way, everything that I've shown you, that's, that's the whole test setup that we write. That's it. It's a little bit of metadata, some annotations, it's defining the deployment, and then we're off and we're running. So the first thing that's going to happen is um, we're going to find that we come across this test annotation, and it's called should be able to create conference. And we're going to create the conference, use the, the repository to store the conference, <coughs> and then uh, perform an assertion that says, hey, this create event was fired. This right here, should match data set, is where we actually end up doing our assertion logic. As we said, it's a real prime goal of Archelian to not have to write up a whole bunch of the standard boilerplate that we might ordinarily be doing. Um, so what we're doing here is we're saying, um, in a metadata type fashion, in a more of a declarative fashion than a programmatic one, we're saying, let's match the data set that's contained in this conference.yaml file. And you can supply data sets in these files, and it'll validate that what's in the data store is going to match um, what's in there in the very end. You can use the YAML format, the XML format, you can use CSV, it's 
kind of extensible into you know, what you want there. Um, and this, this actually right here is the YAML format that we check. So we've got a very simple file, and this is for one test. Hey, when we create a, a conference, we want to see this created, and then when it's done, that it actually matches this um, conference like entity here. I hadn't realized when I went to go do this talk that our data set is going to contain, coincidentally, the conference for DevOps Belgium, um, which is maybe at odds with the upcoming DevOps France thing here. So sorry about that. Um, what's that? Yeah, well, yeah, more French. <laughs> you can change it to be more French centric. Um, here uh, we have you know, methods for like, all right, we want to be able to create a conference with a session. So we'll be able to match data sets uh, not just on one YAML file, but on two. Here's one um, where we say we're going to run this test and we're going to start off using a data set. In other words, pre populate the database with what's contained in this conference thing, uh, and then do the should match data set at the end. You get the idea. Using the Archelian Persistence extension, um, first of all, you get all the power of Archelian to not deal with the container interaction, but secondly, you've got all of this um, pre-populating the database and then performing your post-condition assertions when you're done in a kind of externalized way using annotations and this to me is a very powerful way of validating your data interactions as you go along. I lost anyone quite yet. I really started off really quickly. Cool. Let's move along maybe to another chapter. A um, little bit sexier than uh, relational data these days would be your SQLs. Very hot topic. <coughs> Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of times may be misunderstood. When you think of NoSQL, what are we, what are we talking about here? Anyone? Flat files. Flat files. Well, that's not SQL. It's not. I had a cafe mocha earlier. That was an SQL. <laughs> yeah, it's not relational. You know what else? So popular these days. Every talk is flooded. No SQL. Um, it comes in like I'll, I'll group things into a variety of flavors, um, and I do here. Um, first of all, I don't know, maybe look at some of the, like where where I think maybe relational data starts to fall down. One uh, is when you start to deal with binary data. Um, before No SQL became a thing, and I used to write applications. I would actually, if I had to store pictures or any number of other things, I would actually like store them and write that binary data in like a web dev type of a thing or some other separate store and then put a reference to it in my relational database. Um, the reason for this is because uh, when it comes to relational data, you can be writing and testing on your own and think that everything's working really right um, until you start to get huge database tables that are filled um, with, with lots of information and then when you start to do queries on it, the queries end up going into a query cache um, and if you have a bunch of binary data in there and you're not careful, then you start to bring all this binary data into your query cache and then it starts to wipe away you know, like all of your efficiency basically goes. And then once you run out of your query cache or your indexes, then you end up doing full table scans to fulfill your queries. So things start to break down. Um, pretty quickly there. Again, someone who's like pretty well versed in dealing with relational databases alone would probably be, you know what, I'm probably not going to enable my query cache for these queries here and make sure that I'm you know, only querying for what I need. You can do that too, totally cool, but I think it starts to fall down there. Um, we start to get into um, a couple of flavors of NoSQL. One that we address in the book um, is the data grid. This is essentially a map that's got infinite bound. It's bounded only by probably the amount of RAM that you've got in the system. It's a distributed map, so every node kind of is able to hold a whole bunch of new information, and you can either have, you can probably have configurable failover, um, I'm sorry, configurable 
or replication strategies so that um, maybe you want to be really, really careful that you don't ever lose data. So you'll make sure you've got your information replicated on three nodes. So maybe you've got a node, you know, 20 node cluster and three nodes had it. Um, and then, you know, typically with like a data grid, some nodes can fall off and others can be like, it'll all kind of rejigger it and go away. Uh, InfiniSpan is the one that we'll talk about here. Um, We've also got graph databases. We use Neo4j within this example. Graph databases are pretty awesome for um, especially like the social media use case, which has become very popular lately. You want to go see all of my friends in a traditional relational database. You query, you get all of my friends, but then you've got um, a very like geometric querying problem where if you want to see all of my second degree friends uh, or all of my transitive <coughs> friends, uh, then probably what you got to do is then run the same query upon all of those or start to you know, run joins and it all becomes um, either like an amazingly complex SQL query or um, probably more frequently something that just doesn't run up to scale. Um, if you take a different way of modeling the data on the back end in the first place, in other words, model the data as a graph, um, then you can actually very easily go and see who's connected just by navigating the graph just as you would uh, in an object graph. It turns out that um, various ways of modeling your data work very well together uh, in tandem. So what we've done for this application is we've got the base of our data in a relational data store and then for things like binary attachments that we want to attach to these conference sessions, maybe a uh, speaker gives a PDF that's going to be uploaded later. We can store that in a data grid and make it available there. And then we actually use um, uh, the graph storage to build relationships on top of the relational model. So again, we have, um, we, we draw up in the book a, a way of doing this and testing it as well, where we draw up our implementation and we draw our relationships and build them atop the relational data model and we have a series of tests that go forth. Um, and using that same repository abstraction, we'll go through and let's see if I can find them. Um, here's an attachment repository test case. We run it with Archelion. We run our deployment. Uh, this is using an InfiniSpan adapter in the back end. So again, we are able to work with a container. Only in this case, our container is an InfiniSpan grid. We create attachments, and uh, we can run our tests there. Um, I'm going to try and think about some of the examples I have that work really well for um, what I have to do today, which is show on screen. The user interface. Um, how are we testing the user interface these days? Yeah, you tell. We've got maybe a script of people clicking in a room. Oh, you just don't. Like, you're serious. You really just. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, we'll leave the microphone. That's a joke. You use your, your user to test your application. You use your user to test your application. Yeah. <coughs> What's that image? It's the. It's, do you have this advertisement out here? It's the Dosakis guy. You know, I have Dosakis. In the United States, we have um, we have a, an ad for a beer, and it's like the most interesting man in the world. And he'll like be like, I don't always drink beer, but what I do, it's Dosakis, and it's made this like phenomenon of all sorts of jokes. And one of them is like, well, I don't always test, but when I do, it's in production. Directly. <laughs> I happen to think we can do better than test in production. Um, we've used the Selenium project. Has anyone? Oh, so when I ask if you guys do user interface testing, and no one talks, you just have Selenium and don't. Uh, Selenium ends up being awesome, but uh, booting it up and again doing the same types of stuff, uh, the same types of problems that we have with booting up and testing in EE, we used Archelion to solve as well because again Archelion. Extensible, so we have um, 
we have an Archelian extension for selenium. And um, at the very bottom here, we have uh, this test, which I will show you, which is awesome. OK, let's take a look at this. We're going to walk through this code, and we're going to imagine what happens. We have an Archelian test class. It's called Add Conference Story. We inject here the web driver. This is the Selenium web driver. Um, and we inject it with this drone annotation. Drone is the name of the Archelian extension, which, which brings our uh, Selenium into the fold. Into the fold. So we've, we've deployed this application. We've injected the web driver. Great. Now we've got the web driver. And we can inject right into our test method here this um, initial page, uh, main page. And from the first page, we're going to say, all right, get us all the available action links. And um, we're going to grab the link um, that says conference. And we're going to instruct Selenium to go to the, to go to the browser and click the link that says conference. Um, once we've done that, we should be presented with the conference form. Um, and we can actually then go grab the form straight from the driver and start to fill it out. And we're going to say, put um, the word test into the, the name field. We're going to put the tagline. We're going to fill out the tagline. We're not going to fill out the start. And we're not going to fill out the end dates. And then we're going to call submit and submit the form. Um, at that point, um, this is going to, yeah? So conference is an object of your application. And the form is kind of a you have. So conference is, um, coming from the conference form right here. This is like an object mapping of the form that's presented to the user. Okay. Have you written it just for your test, or is it part of your application already? Yeah, it's, we've written it for the test, and it's kind of detailed. OK. I think the question is, is it specific to JSX? No. No, that wasn't the question. <laughs> no, it's, it's not specific to JSF. This is like our way in Java of interacting with, uh, you know, this. We have we created this form right here. See this? Um, it's kind of an object representation of what you will really see as a web page. Is it yeah, and it's our way of interacting with. You know, we kind of built this like object model to interact with the page elements so that when we test them, we can kind of do it in a natural language kind of a way. Um, because, I mean, what, what it comes down to is every, when we say, when we fill out the name and the tagline, we hit submit, this is, from a browser perspective, absolutely identical to a real user going through and typing it in. So when we run this test, you run it and you see Chrome pop up and it goes, blip, 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 fill in, blip, and then it closes away and it's done. So it ends up, automating exactly what a real user would do. Um, and, and you know, so you know, when we submit this thing, we want to assert that we don't have an error on the name, we want to assert that we don't have an error on the tagline, and then we also assert that we do have errors uh, on the start and the end fields because we haven't filled them out. Um, so this obviously is just one test. Um, we can run this in any number of ways because Selenium is configurable. We can use the PhantomJS driver to run it headless, right? Because PhantomJS, anyone uses this? PhantomJS is awesome. It's a web browser that doesn't show you anything. Uh, and it's designed for testing. So you can do all this in a completely headless environment and run your tests, and it's great. So it's good for all of your running a build on a continuous integration server, for example. Uh, and then when you want to actually see it go through on your own, you just go into the config file and swap out instead of phantom.js, type the word Chrome, and then when you run the test, you'll actually see Chrome will pop up, it'll fill in all the fields, it'll submit it, and it does it you know, quicker than any human ever could, uh, and then reports the, the results back to you. Um, so this is one way that we use Archelian. Again, the mission of Archelian is not to provide really any services, it's to integrate with the best of stuff that's around and to remove all the startup code for you. So again, this is the entire test class. Um, you're not setting up a container. You're not setting up anything. You're not even setting up Selenium. It boots it all up for you. And then what we do is we advise you some ways 
to interact with your page as a Java object. Yep. To pull in the stuff, yeah, do the bindings. Um, and again, the goal isn't for you to leave here knowing how to do anything in particular. I just want to show you the types of stuff that's in here that we do cover, and then you can pull it, fork it on your own, and like play around. Um, there is one more test that I'd kind of like to show before we open to questions and let everyone finish up here. Um, has anyone ever tried to test asynchronous type stuff? Testing asynchronous. Okay. So I came up with this use case, which I think is amazingly common and is probably never ever tested. Um, but I'll bet you, like most every application out there, is doing it. Ever have an application that needs to send an email? No. <laughs> Think of all the complexity that's involved when you send an email from your application. And I guarantee that like most people are not testing to make sure that this thing is like fully hooked in. When you send an email, first of all, you're dispatching a message to some sort of remote service eventually, right? Um, and it's asynchronous, so like, is that thing ever getting delivered? Or is it ever getting processed? Um, on top of that asynchronous component, which deals with an external service, you also have uh, the problem of that, like, all right, well, as the user is clicking through, you probably don't want them to have to block on the actual connecting to this SMTP thing to send the email, right? You don't want the user to have to wait. If they're going through a user registration, they shouldn't have to wait on the application to then connect out to this SMTP server. Um, so what I've done uh, is wrote up this um, email service on the back end, um, which I've implemented here as a singleton EJV. Um, and um, it has kind of two methods. Um, one is called send mail, which is the method that will just send the mail in line and sends it um, Serially, right? No, no asynchrony here. The second one is called QMail for delivery. And what we do in QMail for delivery is we take the mail message you want to send, we drop it onto a JMS queue, and then um, we return control to the user. So once it's on the queue, whatever picks it up off the queue, that's going to be the thing that's responsible for actually sending the email. Cool. Um, have we ever tried to test messages sent to JMS queues? I spent a significant amount of time on uh, the JBoss application server team. Let me tell you how we, as experts of creating application servers, tested our JMS stuff. We had a test suite. It had, I don't know, four or 5,000 tests on it, many of which ended up being JMS tests. So what we would do is we would start up the test, we would send a message, we would thread.sleep for seven seconds, and then we would send another request into the application server to see if the message had been received and was processed. This has two very glaring problems. Anyone want to venture a guess as to what the thread.sleep, one of the two problems is? Room full of intelligent people, I know you got it. <laughs> I'm sorry? Uh, right. Uh, it's just the test, right? I mean, it does prevent other work from being done. The test doesn't need to work anymore. But it does make uh, a seven second wait times the 400 JMS tests that we have um, makes for a lot of seconds of just waiting around to see if a message is been received. Yeah. And the message getting queued. We have a make throw an exception that prevents uh, the process being uh, revised. Okay, so if it throws an exception, 
then probably that test will fail, and then the test will fit, and that's what we'll want, though, right? You had it kind of with the first one. The first one is that um, when you start putting thread dot sleeps into your tests, you have to multiply that by the number of thread sleeps you have, and now you've got a test suite which is going to take forever to complete. Um, and the, the problem with test suites that kind of take forever to complete is it means that your developers aren't going to be encouraged to run them locally first before they send them off to be put upstream. This was before the days of Git, so we were, you know, anyone anyone who was working on it had commit access and wasn't running the full test suite locally by making all their changes because the test suite took forever to run. So we would just make our changes, send them off, continuous integration would get it, and then maybe the next day we might find it or something. Um, so it slows down the test suite is one problem. The other problem is that seven seconds may not be enough time for this thing to have completed doing whatever it needs to do. Maybe some other process on the machine was asking for attention and it was blocking. So then we get to the case of like 400 JMS tests and on any given test run, four or five of them are going to be failing, transient failures. And you've got to actually, you don't get clean runs, you don't get reliable runs. We would actually go and look at the, the test results and be like, eh, that seems transient, that seems transient, that seems transient. And then there was one instance when we thought a whole bunch of stuff was transient, and we discovered like months later that nope, that there was actually like a real problem in the JMS subsystem. So the threads stop sleep method or mechanism of testing asynchronous events doesn't necessarily fly for me. Um, so, all right, what are we going to do about it? Well, um, we're going to do a couple things. One, um, I can't test with like a proper SMTP server. This is going to be a rare case when I, when I need to use a mock. Um, because our Killian is actually letting you test into the real container, um, I tend to not use mocks as much as possible. Because to me, a mock is by definition mocking runtime code that's not going to be available in production, so you're, you're testing something that's, that's not really true, right? Um, but this to me is one case when you probably should use a mock because you can't test this other avail, you know, you can't test one piece of, of the pipe, but you can test everything else. So we'll swap in our own SMTP service. Um, and what I do in the test is I say, all right, um, I'm gonna make an SMTP service which has this SMTP server. It's like I use an embedded library called Sabitha, and um, it's in, like implemented as an EJB, which on you know has a startup method and it'll bind to the port. And now when my application sends messages, it's actually sending them in the test environment. It'll send them to my SMTP server where I can listen in on events. Great. So just keep in mind that I control the SMTP server. And when the SMTP server gets emails, um, instead of sending them, I'm just going to know that they're there and I'll be able to do stuff. Here comes my SMTP mail service test case. I am going to deploy an application I am going to deploy the SMTP server service I just mentioned. And I'm going to deploy the mail service, which is the part that I mentioned before that, that allows us to send mail and queue it for delivery. <coughs> Great. Here is the body of my test method. It's called test SMTP async. It's an asynchronous operation. Uh, here we go. Who is familiar with this class? Cyclic barrier? java.util.concurrent.cyclicbarrier. Usually when I ask people that, like, no one knows what cyclic barrier is, and then I'm like, you know, java util concurrent, people are like, oh yeah, I know that, it's obviously, it's in the GDK. Uh, cyclic barrier kind of works like this. Um, you can give it a, a number here, and this is the number of parties that are gonna wait. So like, let's say this thing right here is my cyclic barrier, um, and I initialize it at two, it's going to say, um, it's going to be a gate. So the first person comes, and it's still a gate, and then not until the second person comes, does it like release, and those guys can go forward, and then the barrier comes along again, and that's why it's cyclic, because it kind of resets itself, and it's always going to wait for parties of two and let them through together, right? Kind of like a bouncer at a club, is like, 
no, no, you can go as long as you have a girl with you. you know, but like, everyone's going to wait until there's a girl. All right, now you can go. Um, that's cyclic barrier. The beauty of this like, Archelian situation is that what we do is we actually take this test, and when we deploy it, we deploy the test inside the deployment. You define the deployment for us, and then very sneakily what we do is we take the test, and we put the test inside the deployment, deploy it into the container, so the test itself is executing in the container, in the deployment, and then we report the results back. So in this instance, this test is actually executing inside the container, which means that we can do things like take advantage of the shared memory and Java util concurrent. So when this test runs, we can say, OK, we'll set up a cyclic barrier. We will set a handler on this SMTP server service. And the handler will say, um, barrier, wait. OK, so this is. Uh, like this green guy here. This, this red one is our barrier. Um, in, this, in the service, uh, it'll say, all right, um, the barrier, the first party, this is our SMTP server, and it's going to wait. And it's going to wait there until something else comes along. Um, then we're going to take the message, construct a mail message, call upon the mail service to queue mail for delivery. Then the test is going to wait because the test has taken this message, sent it, dispatched it off, and now it says, wait. Now, they've both waited, because uh, the test is waiting to make sure that it's got confirmation that um, the, the SMTP server service is there. The SMTP server service is waiting to make sure it gets a message. Once they're both there, then everything's OK. The barrier clears, uh, and the test can, con can continue its test execution and get to the end. If we got a timeout exception, uh, then the test fails. And the is the max, right? It's maximum five seconds. Yeah, maximum five seconds. Uh, if, if, it, if it, you know, we'll get a timeout exception if it exceeds five seconds. So, yeah, there is like a timing element, but like we're going to wait up to a maximum of five seconds. If not then, then whatever. And if you start to get transient errors where like things aren't happening, you just bump that number up to 20 or 30 or whatever it is you want. But you don't end up out of necessity having to wait that full 30 seconds, you know, it'll that barrier will clear the second the second that email has been received by the SMTP server. So, I mean, there's there's a lot going on here. There's like conceptually this is kind of difficult, but take a look at the test code. For a very complex test, there isn't a lot here. You're basically setting up that the mail service is going to wait. You're sending the message and sending it to wait. And, and that's it. And this, to me, is probably the most difficult to test type of a use case um, that I can come up with. And you know, using the Archelian test platform and taking advantage of that, it runs inside the container and can take advantage of all sorts of things. By the way, when you run inside the container, you don't. It's not just the threading and the shared memory that you can take advantage of. We inject. I didn't show before, but we inject user transaction objects into the test. We can inject directly entity managers. We can, we can inject like basically anything that you want from the container inside the test and use it because you're running inside the deployment. Um, and that to me makes things very powerful, very testable, and should be like forming your development and basically giving you no excuse when you're writing something to make sure that it's working correctly, which to me gives me like amazing peace of mind by the time I'm done. Knowing that like I've done things right, this test has turned green, and like I can now move on to something else. Um, testing to me is not a chore. It's actually like part of the. It's, it's a really very enjoyable process because you spend a bunch of time getting an API right, and then when you write your test, you actually get to see your API that's intended to be used. And then by the time the thing turns green, like I feel very like, all right, I can now close the book on this thought that I'm having with this chapter and move on to something else. Um, and Archelian for us has been the project that's opened up the doors to doing a lot of these types of things. Um, and our community has been great with contributing the persistence extension, the user interface extensions, all these um, other types of things. So um, 
you know, if 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 you're doing enterprise application development, which it looks like most of you are, I'd really kind of urge you to take a look at the book. The whole thing is available online if you want to poke through it first. If you want to buy it and have a paper copy, that's awesome. Uh, if you just want to kind of fork it and run the examples on your own, you know, this the GeekSeq application runs. Um, GeekSeq.continuousdev.org. Um, you know, this, this thing is actually running as um, like working proof that we've put all this together and it works properly. Um, um, the book actually hasn't launched yet, so like, you know, this is that um, We also have a chapter that details our build process. It's like a continuous integration type of a thing. Every, you know, it shows how we lined up the, the push to the Git repo, which then CloudBees listens in on, and then it runs our build for us. And then if that build is good, it kicks off another thing. And then finally, at the end of it, it does a push to OpenShift, which is what's posting this, um, which is taking a little while to come up, but that's all fine. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about all I got for this. It seems. Seems kind of late now, like 10 15. Is that about right? I think, I think I've asked enough of your time today. <laughs> you like this, right? Like that, that's the first time I've used props, so that's, that's kind of cool. We have like five or ten minutes. Aaron, I don't know if you guys want to ask any question about anything, any topic. Uh, I was thinking, you know, I'm severely jet lagged. Yeah. I, I was literally thinking of kind of, you know, kind of lounging on one of those couches. Yeah. I'm glad I did it. Oh, I would have thrown you. You would have kicked me around otherwise. You would you would have been the barrier. I would have thrown the match. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And uh, Google is offering a Devox France ticket tonight. So, if you want to throw any questions at Arun and Andrew. Yeah, we got oh yeah, t-shirts, t-shirts to throw. For anyone who came here not wearing a shirt, we got covered. <laughs> uh, I would like to know if uh, uh, I talk to you with uh, Arcadia. Uh, can we test the uh, swing applications? I'm sorry, I can't. Swing applications. Swing, swing user. All right, okay, so again, so Archelian is this just kind of very generic um, core uh, with a series of adapters. Um, we don't have a swing adapter yet. I mean, you basically would just, uh, we have a, a guide for, I can't believe I didn't show you this. By the way, I don't think I properly really like introduced myself before I look at Twitter thing if you want to come find and yell at me later. Um, it's totally cool. Um, Archelion.org is um, our documentation site. Um, and we have here under guides, I believe, um, developing a container adapter, which you would then use. And that kind of, it, it'll show you our SPI, and you'd implement the SPI to kick off whatever you needed to do to start up your swing app. You know, we're doing something kind of, sim kind of similar now for um, using it, uh, using Archelia to test Android apps, kick off Android, um, the VM. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you get, you get a t-shirt. I, like, I feel like Oprah. Like, you get a t-shirt. I just uh, want to ask about um, making the form as a Java object. What is that? So, uh, for example, if you uh, If I go to Chrome and uh, just fill the form, uh, I will uh, reply. Uh, what uh, when I write a class, I will spend the 15 minutes to do the, the, the same thing. Uh -huh. What is the, the, the main purpose of uh, making the form at Java? Uh, uh, just so that you can code it in the test and interact with the web driver. Yeah, that's about it. 
why do that instead of typing it in on your own into the browser? Because you could make a mistake. <laughs> How are, well, when you kick off a continuous integration build, are you then going to monitor it and then fill in all the form values every time? No, what's the, what's the purpose? The, the, well, the entire purpose is to automate the whole thing. Yeah, if you can automate the whole thing, you remove the human error element and you make it a lot faster. I mean, I wish that my machine hadn't completely died on me tonight um, because you'd see, you know, I basically would I'd go right click on the, in the IDE, I'd right click on the test class, say run as JUnit, and boot up. You'd see Chrome as a window on your screen for maybe a second and a half. You fill in all the stuff, show that whatever, and it's gone. You know, and first, so I mean, you don't work that quickly, and you could end up, you know, writing using that format object and that interaction. You could end up writing a thousand tests or something. It goes that quickly. It's so much quicker than, uh, you know, I used to work for a company years back, and we had dedicated QA people, and with every like milestone release or candidate for a release. They would then spend three days clicking through all the screens and typing in the stuff and validating the result on their own. It was amazingly time consuming and error prone. Here we've given you a way that uh, it's not time consuming. It can be automated and done correctly every time by a continuous integration build. And it'll be done, you can do it at every commit if you want. So you catch errors immediately as you go, not have to wait for. Is that a uh, I have a question on, on, on what for uh, uh, on cl class loading mechanism on, on, on what for and, and, and you said that uh, you are using GPOS modules to, to do that. And, uh, but the problem is you have to put uh, 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 modules, ex uh, module.xml files, the, the niche of your jars not to be able to, to, load, uh, to, to, to load exactly this uh, yeah. yeah, this jar and be able to index it. So if 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 uh, uh, so if you are using third party libraries who don't have those those files, how you how you do that? You can't do that manually, or you can generate the, the, the file for this. Or yeah, there is a manual way by which you can do that. Uh, typical example is let's say if you have a JDBC Type Four driver, and let's say you wanna you don't wanna bundle it in your lib directory, or you don't wanna bundle it as part of a war file then you can install that third party driver as a standard JBoss module in the modules directly and there is documentation available on that on how you can do that. Now that is just one way but yeah, I mean, you can do that pretty much for any third party framework where you can expose this as a JBoss module to rest of your wild life. But the problem with this is like when you get a new version of your delivery, you have to go back and do it manually a single time. And it's just like, there's no automatic way to just Put the, the jar file and then and then and then the, 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 you can do it in the WAR way. You just yeah. read in the lib and you're done, right? Just Maven will read the WAR with the dependencies. But you can do it the pure Java E way. Yeah, but but you have cases where you uh, where your jars are not just in the WAR. You can like uh, like you know it dynamically at run time. I think well. one thing important to understand is JBoss modules is doesn't try to solve the world hunger. Um, it tries to solve modular class loading. You know, if you're looking at version dependency, and you know I want to manage multiple versions and have cross dependencies, then there are other ways by which you can do that. So for example, I mean OSGI was kind of created to that part of it, and of course we're waiting for JDK nine, hopefully, to solve modularity problem. You know we've been hearing that for 34 years now, but we'll see you know when that gets resolved. Uh, but essentially that's what you're coming at, and I think I agree that is completely a valid problem. Um, but there are multiple ways of solving it in a application specific way at this point. Or you can do it with the uh, puppet. That's what we do. You know, puppet just creates instances of JBoss and configures them with the right configuration and the right jars, and you can update your jars, etc. Et so you can automate that with the puppet. You know, as an example. There you go. Okay. Here, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, last one. We've all heard a lot about like okay. another question. Can <laughs> <laughs> I, I for a second? Can we all talk about like modularity in Java? 
Do we know what we're talking about when we talk about the modularity? <coughs> like it's class loading hell. Class loading Like you understand uh, like the, the base problem. Everyone can raise their hand if they if they're certain they know the problem. You gotta, but I hear a lot that folks don't get why modularity is a thing, and I totally understand why it's not understood. If everyone doesn't raise their hand, I'm going to, to explain it. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> It's late. This is worth nothing. What's that? Wednesday night. Uh, what's that? Uh, yeah, all right. Here's, here it is very, very quickly. Uh, yes, you need to supply more explicit metadata to JBoss modules. Yes, it is an incredible pain in the ass. Here's why it is good. It is a pain in the butt to do it. Because it's good. Because it's good. <laughs> In traditional Java class loading, we have uh, what's called this delegation model. In the delegation model, uh, class loaders are in a hierarchy. We have at the very top the system class loader, which has the things that load in like Java Lang string and a bunch of other stuff in the JDK. Then you have your application class loader, which picks up everything from the dash dash class path. And then we have a bunch of other class loaders that are created from there and they, they go all the way down. So it would be like the JBoss AS class loader or the, the Wildfly class loader in a non-class loading model, or non-modular model, and then like a whole bunch of childs from there. If in the child class loader you request a class, what it does is it goes all the way up because in standard Java class loading, it's a parent first delegation model. So it will go all the way up. So let's say you deploy a, a EJB, and your EJB um, has your own like logging version, log4j thing. Uh, and you expect that to be used because you've bundled it inside your application and you've compiled against it. But now you put it into AS in a non-modular fashion and it goes to look up the log for jlogger and instead it finds the one way up here used by the Java app, you know, the JBoss application server on its own. And then you start to like, maybe your version's newer and you start to call some methods that you compile against, and because it loaded in the version that's older, now you've got some sort of like no such method errors or linkage errors or other sorts of like weird runtime things, and you don't understand what the heck is going on because it's not apparent because you've bundled this thing in right next to it, and very clearly it should all make sense. Modular class loading says, okay, instead of having this ridiculous hierarchy, what we do is we separate things out and we say, okay, the server, the server has its own jars, its own logging jars, its own hibernate jars. Your application has its own jars, and these two things don't see each other. So therefore, they can't conflict. The reason you need more metadata is for like, if something here needs to see something here, then you have to explicitly draw that line to let it. That's why modularity is important, because otherwise you have this like one namespace of class loader complete pollution and it leads to like ridiculous problems at runtime that are very, very difficult to debug. It's fine if you get a no such method error, maybe not so fine if you're exposing a bug and you start to go through the source code and that bug isn't in the version of the thing you think you're looking at and you're actually using another thing. If you want, if you want, if you want more detail on this, you can see the yeah. Cool. Yeah, there's a great talk by David Lloyd actually as well. This is a recording from one of the JBoss actually Java ones from 2012. It provides complete details about modular service container and how does it work. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question you know, for the book. Um, what are the four new technologies in Java E7, and which one of them are implemented in Wildfly? Website, JSON, Eve, Batch, and Cryptocurrency. Dang it! Okay, let's see if somebody can repeat that answer. <laughs> You know what? You get three fourths of the book, you get half one, one quarter of the book. <laughs> you just want <laughs> chapters one through seven. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Support uh, in the uh, flight uh, I'm not able to uh, to run examples uh, with the uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, embeddable EGB, right? Em embeddable EGB, you said? Uh, embedded EGB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that embeddable EGB was deprecated in 3.2, and that's the reason we did not. But uh, actually, it was made optional in EGB 3.2, and so we removed that implementation. As a matter of fact, the GitHub arc, uh, workspace that I showed has about 200 plus tests. One of the tests was using embeddable EGB, and we realized that's not that's passing on Classfish, but not on Wildfly. And then when I read the spec, it very clearly said embeddable EGB is optional, no need to support it, and Wildfly decided to actually not implement it. And there you go. Yeah, I have two answers for, for that regard. Is, one is uh, there are two kind of work around. Uh, one is, of course, you can use Arquidian and then run the stuff. Uh, the other one is what was thinking about doing a undertow lag bootstrap API, but for Wildfly. So you could literally, in your main of your app, literally start Wildfly. That's going to be 9 or 9.1 or, or 10. Could be faster if you guys give us a hand, but uh, <laughs> we're thinking about it anyway. Why the name? Uh, listen to the podcast. Okay. The answer that. <laughs> that's, that's probably a long answer. So, you guys have a beautiful city. You're awesome to hang out with us until like 10.30 at night. Um, thank you for... 